The word of God is a life-giving force. It is literally the means by which all of creation came to be, the word. Where the word of God is, there is power. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. We've decided to take the pulpit outside of the building, where it's needed the most, to the street, to the sidewalk, to the people. We are the church. Join us every Monday as we occupy all spaces and share the gospel with the world. It's time for a new language, Kinglish, the language of faith. What's up, family? My name is CJ Matthews, and welcome to another episode of Kinglish, the language of faith, where we just come together and look at God's word. Um, and today, actually, I want to start a series uh, within the series, and that series is called The Blueprint. Jesus is easily the most polarizing figure uh, of all time, and there's so much uh about him so much misinformation so much wrong information so much so many misconceptions so many things but i want to look at specifically not only what does the bible say but particularly what does jesus let us know about himself um just like you you know throughout this quarantine i've gotten a chance to to catch up on a lot of uh and watch a lot of different things but one of the most interesting things that I got a chance to take a look at which actually I haven't even finished yet I got to go back and watch the last couple of episodes is uh the last dance with uh Michael Jordan and and the Bulls and because there hasn't been a lot going on one of the things that this documentary has done it has brought to light a lot of the things that was going on during those times a lot of people giving their uh, personal encounters with uh, Michael Jordan and the Bulls and things like that. But out of all of the things that I've seen uh, relating to this documentary, one thing in particular really stuck out to me, and that is uh, Magic Johnson sort of telling this story about uh, him and Mike, him and uh, Jordan uh, going at each other and really battling. And there was an instance where they were all playing on the All-Star team and they were uh, out in a foreign country and they were having a practice and this practice uh, filled with all of these all-stars really turned into almost like a one-on-one -on -one battle because they were really jockeying for position and basically the throne of the NBA at that time. Uh, Magic Johnson had been basically on the throne, basically been the greatest player in the world. But Michael Jordan was ready to let him and the whole world know, know, know that like, no, I'm here. I have arrived. This is my league. Magic Johnson really was was unwilling to relinquish the throne. But by the time that this particular practice, this particular scrimmage, this particular battle was over, even Magic Johnson himself had to say, all right, Michael Jordan is here. This is his uh, league. And basically, Michael Jordan just let it be known, like, there's a new sheriff in town. And ultimately, what Michael Jordan did in that was he established and inserted himself uh, he established and him inserted himself into that position. And to a much greater degree, this is what Jesus does throughout uh, the book of John. Jesus basically says, I'm here and this is how things are going to be now that I am here. So he reveals himself and he identifies exactly who he is and particularly and specifically who he is in relationship to us this whole session this whole series this whole series is about our relationship to jesus because really that is the foundation of a believer and really not only is it the foundation but it's it's everything it's the whole thing. That relationship is what this whole thing is about. And throughout the book of John, Jesus gives us seven self-identifying statements, also known as the seven I am statements. So what I'd like for us to do is to take a journey together and examine this in this collection of talks called The Blueprint. 
And my prayer for us today, and as we um, embark on this journey, is that somewhere in here that we all get a new revelation of just who he is to us. Because religion has always been about rules, but Jesus has always been about a relationship. And, you know, if you think about it, a part of being in a relationship is learning about the other person, right? Like, and really, no matter how long you're in a relationship, that never stops. Well, hopefully, anyway. Um, I mean, think about how long you've been with your significant significant other. If you've been with them for any uh, extended period of time, you know them very well. You know what makes them laugh. You know how to get on their nerves. You know, you you know you know quite a bit about them, but. The truth is there's still more to learn about your partner because they are still growing. I've been with uh, Brittany for about a year and a half now. It's not terribly long, but we're still learning things about each other. And, and this, this truth, this concept about learning your partner, learning uh, the people that you're in a relationship, uh, it isn't just relegated to romantic relationships, but any relationship uh, that you're in. And one of the main reasons why it's critical that you learn the people that you're in a relationship with is so that you, is so that you know how to deal with them, right? It's so that you know what makes them tick. It's so that you know how to love them. You know what to avoid. You know which buttons not to press. You know what triggers them. But it's a two-way street, right? In order to be in a good or a great relationship, you have to be a good or a great partner. Like everybody wants a great partner, but part of that is being a great partner. Now, real quick, um, just as a side note, you know, as far as ministry goes, as far as preaching goes, I mainly stayed away from like relationship type of stuff. Um, but I'm about to get in my relationship bag real soon. You know, I got I got some stuff to say, so uh, stay tuned. But it's a two way street, right? Like in a relationship, you have to take the time to learn the other person. Whatever kind of relationship you're in. Like, if I want to be a good dad, I have to take the time to learn my kid. If I want to be a good husband, I have to take the time to learn my wife. If I want to be a good coach, I got to take the time to learn my players. So, I mean, I could think about it. I had a lot of coaches who would approach me a certain way. But as a coach, or part of being a good coach is knowing, like, okay, coming at this person, yelling at them, attacking them, cussing them out, it motivates this person while it makes this other person shut down. So if I want to be a good coach, I got to know how to deal with my players. Same thing about being a good pastor. I have to know how to deal with the people who it is that I'm in this partnership, in this relationship uh, with. And that's the beauty about being in, re in a relationship with Jesus, about being in a relationship with God. It's because, like, the world has sold us and given us this idea as if God is just like this principle that's just like waiting to punish us when we mess up. But it's like, I don't know where we got that from. But the beauty about being in a relationship with him is he knows you, right? He knows us so well. And we could put up this facade to the world, but he knows us. And you could think of it like in a negative way, like, oh, my God, he knows what I'm really like. No, it ain't even about that. He knows you. He know what you're going to do. He know the wrongs that you was going to make before you even made them. Right. But the fact that he knows us so well is what makes him the perfect friend, the perfect mentor and whatever else, because he knows us even better than we know ourselves. And in that relationship, what he'll do is he'll provide us. He'll mold us refine us and perfect us in that relationship he'll lead us toward the things that light our souls on fire he'll stir up that gift that he's placed within you he'll perfect that gift inside of you and at the same time not only will he lead you toward the things that you're really passionate about but he'll change your desires away from the things that cause you pain Right. Like he'll curb your appetite. He'll, he'll, he'll cause you to desire things that benefit you, things that are good for you, not only physically, but spiritually, things that nourish your soul um, as well. I mean, I think about it. Um, there was a point in my life where I probably and I'm now let me preface this. I'm not knocking anybody. <laughs> I, 
I'm not saying this to knock anybody, but it's just something about my own personal experience. Like, there was a time in my life where I probably smoked more weed than anybody else. And it's really only a negative thing because it cost me a lot, right? Like, I've gotten a lot of pain, I've gotten a lot of trouble and different things as a result. So one day, basically, just out of the sky blue, different things starting to happen and I started to, be, to get like an aversion to it. Next thing I know, and people who knew me back then probably couldn't even imagine it, but it's been over five years. Now I'm not saying that to knock anybody who smokes, but I'm saying there are certain things that we enjoy that may cause us pain, but being in that relationship with Jesus, he will change your desires, right? Like a lot of times we're telling you to stop doing this, stop doing that, like that has never worked. Look historically, but in that relationship, he can change you from the inside out. He, in this relationship, he'll teach you how to love yourself. There's a lot of talk about self-love, self-love being the best love. And self-love is great. Not only is it great, but it's essential, it's necessary. But let me ask you this, where can you learn how to love yourself better than from the person that made you? So if I really, if I really want to practice self-love, then I got to learn how to love myself from the person who knows me the best. That's in my relationship with God. And, you know, to the next to, to take that to the next level, as I learn about Jesus, as he reveals more about himself to me in the process, I learn more about me. Right. So um, let's get into this first self-identifying statement. Well, actually. Real quick, there's something that Jesus says. Well, we're about to jump into John chapter six, but there's something he says in John chapter five um, that I just have to mention. It is so deep and really it's an underlying theme to this whole uh, series and basically to his whole ministry and the whole point of, of of why he came because he had to establish a new normal. He had to let people know the shifts that were taking place. But he says, um, he says, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. He says, but it's they, it's the scriptures, it's the Bible that bear witness about me. Don't get so caught up in church. Don't get so caught up in religion that you miss me. Everybody's so eager and thirsty for the method to get this or the steps to get that. He says, you so busy looking for a word, looking for a method. I am the word. I am the method. Another translation says it like this. You miss the forest for the trees. Wow. In other words, first things first. It's like this can become about so much that we miss the main thing. Jesus. That's why this series is even uh, entitled to a blueprint, because the simplest definition of a blueprint is a plan. At the, at the end of the day, a blueprint ain't nothing but a plan. Jesus is God's plan for your life. He reveals that plan by letting us know who he is to us and what he does for us and what he has for us. Relationship. Matter of fact, write that down. Relationship over religion. The relationship is the key. The relationship is the secret. The relationship is the biggest life hack that there is. So in the first um, self-identifying statement, what Jesus says is, he says, I am the bread of life. Matter of fact, let me go ahead and, and just read a couple of these verses to you just so that you can have them. Um, it's found in John chapter six, uh, verses 22 through 35 it says on the following day when the people who were standing on the other side of the sea saw that there were no other boats there except that one which his disciples had entered and that Jesus had not entered the boat with his disciples but his disciples had gone away alone however other boats came from Tiberias near the place where they ate bread after the Lord had given thanks when the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there nor his disciples they also got into the boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus and they found him on the other side of the sea they said to him rabbi when did you come here Jesus answered them and said most assuredly I say to you you seek me not because you saw the signs but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but 
for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. They said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he sent. Therefore, they said to him, what sign will you perform then that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then Jesus said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, no, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Amen. He says, I am the bread of life. And really, bread in this case is a very interesting metaphor because uh, in our culture, bread is sort of this thing that you can take it or leave it. You know, matter of fact, we're told not to indulge, indulge that much into carbs. So really, we not even they tell us not even to eat that much bread. More and more people are being born with an intolerance to gluten. And when I think about it, I actually don't even know what gluten is. Um, I just think that it's in bread. It might not even be. <laughs> I don't know. But for the, no, for the most part, nobody goes anywhere just for the bread. Like, I don't go anywhere just for the bread except Red Lobster. Like, I'm not a huge seafood guy. So if I ever go to Red Lobster, it's just because I need a couple of baskets of Cheddar Bay biscuits. But other than that, you know, restaurants give out bread for free. It's not that big a deal. It's not the main course. So that's what we have to understand today. It was the exact opposite in the culture that Jesus lived in. In Jesus's culture, bread was the main dish, right? Like if you think about the Last Supper, they had bread. Bread was the main course, and they drank wine. And what Jesus is telling us today is, I'm not an appetizer. I'm not something that you can take it or leave it. I am the main thing. I am what this entire thing is all about. In other words, I am essential. That's a real buzzword right now. I am essential. And so often Christianity makes a lot of things the main dish and they serve a little Jesus on the side. That's the purpose for this. We're here to change that. Um, I'm not sure if you're a big uh, rap music fan, but in rap, you know, it's changed a little bit, but it's always been about everybody that come out, they, they always talking about, I'm here to bring the real back. I'm here to restore the feeling. I don't know if you ever heard anybody say that, like, I'm here to bring back the real. But today, I'm here to bring back Jesus. He says, I am the bread of life. And really to understand it, we have to understand the context in which he says it. Where we find ourselves right here in John chapter 6, where we pick up Jesus, if this was today, if he had, if this had been today, uh, the hashtag Jesus would be trending worldwide because he had just performed two of the most popular, two of the most famous miracles of all times. I'm sure that you've heard of him, even if you don't subscribe to the Bible or follow Jesus. He had literally just got done feeding a crowd of at least 5,000 people with this little kid's Happy Meal. He fed 5,000 people with a little fish fillet Happy Meal. Well, really, it was five loaves of bread and two fish. Happy Meal just actually sounds a little bit better to me. But the point is, he miraculously feeds thousands of people with this small ration of food. And what's even crazier is not do they all eat, but they still had leftovers when they had all eaten. So he feeds 5,000 people with this Happy Meal. Keep reading. A couple of disciples witness him or observe him walking on water. And one of his disciples, Peter, actually gets to walk on water too. So where we pick up right here, people are still in awe about him feeding all of those people. So they follow him. They're like, Man, where'd this dude go? We got to catch up with him. We got to find out what's, what's going on. So they follow him. They're like, man, like, who is this dude that he can do all of this crazy, amazing, ridiculous stuff? They come up to him, ask him questions. And he responds to the crowd like, you're only interested. You only interested in me. You only pursuing me because of what I just did for you. I ain't saying you a gold digger, but 
No, I'm just playing. But basically, this begins a back and forth between Jesus and this group that are so intrigued by his miraculous ability. But in this exchange, in this back and forth, two paradigm shifting things are revealed that I want to point out. Two things that unfortunately are keeping a lot of Christians in bondage, a bondage that they've already been freed from. So I'm praying for a spiritual Juneteenth today that those who were set free will receive the freedom that Jesus paid for with his blood. The first thing that he points out is the battle between the physical and the spiritual, the battle between the temporary and the eternal. Some verses like going on Instagram. But the ramifications or implications of this verses of this battle show up every day. Right. It shows up in the battle between my sight versus my faith. Right. Like each and every day I'm faced with the battle, the battle of being able to trust what God said, despite what I see. And it shows up in so many other ways. But what he says is don't labor for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to everlasting life. It's real easy to miss what he's saying. Let me tell you what he's not saying. He's not saying don't get a job and go to work and provide food for your family and put food on the table. He's not saying anything like that. But what he's saying is I need to expand your scope. I need to expand your mind, your understanding beyond the material. Right. Beyond the stuff that's fleeting. Um, I recently watched a movie on Netflix. I think it was called All Day and the Night. And throughout the movie, this quote kept coming up. It went something like this. So it said, because of slavery, we learn how to survive, but not how to live. I thought that was really deep. They said, because of slavery, we learn how to survive and not how to live. Right here, Jesus is saying a very similar thing. He's saying, I want you to make that leap from survival mode to life mode. I want you to come out of survival mode and I want you to live. I want you to thrive. I want you to ultimately, I want you to flourish. But he's saying, this is what I need you to understand. It's not found in this. It's not found in that. That type of life that I'm talking about can't be found anywhere but in a relationship with me. He says, don't get so caught up in things that have an expiration date. <clears throat> don't get so caught up in material things. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, you know, I hear this, I read this, I'm, I'm internalizing this. I love to shine. <laughs> but in our capitalistic society that's based on consumerism and materialism, it's really easy to not just consume stuff, but to become consumed by the stuff. And if you think about it, at the end of the day, a Rolex and an Apple Watch tell the same time. I still want one. But, you know, it's nothing wrong with having nice things, but everything has to be kept in its proper place. This applies spiritually as well. Religion and church can become so consumed and preoccupied with things less relevant. And what happens is when the focus of the church is wrong, there's collateral damage. A lot of times what happens is we create barriers to entry. We get in the way of people having a relationship with Jesus. When in all actuality, our entire job is just to point people to him. So in essence, what Jesus is saying is you have to learn the difference between the guns and the butter. I don't know if you ever seen the movie Baby Boy, but one of the most uh, emphatic scenes is when Melvin, who is basically like the stepfather of Tyrese, a.k.a. Jody, comes in to give him like that little OG wisdom. And he explains the difference between guns and butter, the difference between assets and liabilities. And he, he really drops a gem on him. Now, of course, initially, because of the messenger, baby boy or Jody can't really receive it. But that's what I hear Jesus saying right here. You got to understand the difference between the guns and the butter. And the thing about it is Melvin was right to a certain extent. Like financial literally, I mean, financial literacy is literally a biblical principle. 
a bit of biblical principle. The Bible says a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Which means that basically there are some principles, there's some understandings that I can impart to you that uh, will allow you to manage your money to the point that you're building wealth, to the point that your descendants get to benefit from the decisions and the things that you have made. And not only will you leave them the money, but you will leave them the wisdom too so that it, can, it will continue. So financial literacy is in fact a biblical principle, but there's more, right? He's saying, don't spend your whole life making a living and forget to live. Jesus says, what I have for you is eternal life. Life, eternal life is a very interesting thing. And words like this are really easy uh, to miss because of the uh, limitedness. I don't know if that's right. The limitedness of the English language. Like the English language is really uh, simple. It's not that complex. We only have one word for life. In the Greek, they have at least three, but two that I want to point out. Um, they have at least two. And the first one is bios. And it deals with the physical life, like the body. It's where we get the word biology from. But he's saying, don't be cons so concerned with the bios. Because what I have for you is this, the other word that they have, which is zoe, Z-O-E, zoe. And zoe is eternal life. And so often when we think about eternal life, we're thinking about duration. And it does uh, have to do with duration, but not only does it include duration or does it describe a duration of time or a duration of life, but really what it also describes is a quality of life. He says there's a quality of life that's only found in partnership, that's only found in connection and relationship to me. And here's one of the main reasons why this bread of life example is so important, why it makes so much sense. Like, I don't care who you are, where you at right now, if you didn't just eat, if you ate at any point today, if not now, sometime in the near future, you will get hungry. Right? Like you eat, <clears throat> you don't just eat one time in life. It's like you eat, you get hungry again, you need to eat again, you need to eat again. And what he's saying is, unlike the physical bread, what I have to give you isn't fleeting. It fills you once and for all. The problem comes from when we place the source of our fulfillment in things that don't endure, then we'll never be fulfilled because we'll always need a fix. That sounds actually good. That's all kind of good. Let me say it again. The problem is when we place our source of fulfillment in things that don't fulfill, that don't endure, then we'll never be fulfilled because we'll always need a fix. He says, I have come to fulfill your hunger indefinitely, not physically, but spiritually, internally right to your core so when it comes to bread this group of people that he's talking to the audience that he's referring to they have a, a frame of reference for heavenly or miraculous bread I'm sure you heard of Moses before but basically what happens is in the life of Moses let me give you a brief synopsis of Moses right, this, this Moses this, this is the, the short CJ version of Moses so God God's people they were in bondage. They were in slavery. God chose Moses to help liberate his people. They liberate his people. Uh, they come from out of the bondage of Pharaoh. They're on their way to the promised land. Unfortunately, their trek to the promised land through uh, the wilderness, uh, uh, they didn't really like so much. They thought that they was going to starve. They thought that they was going to die. And they they really like, man, I'd rather would have died in slavery because at least when we was there, we had something to eat. So what God does is says, OK, this is what I do. I'll provide you heavenly bread. It's actually known as manna, which means what is this? But it's this bread that just showed up and God basically delivered it better than Uber Eats, DoorDash, all that. He delivered it right to them every single day. So they had a, um, a reference to uh, miraculous bread they were like okay we know a little something about some bread but they were still pushing back or maybe it wasn't even that it's just that they were trying to understand because what jesus was revealing didn't fit their schemata it didn't fit their understanding of how things work right it's like trying to fit 
that round block and the square peg, it won't work. So hopefully today, like what he was doing today, he was expanding their minds, opening up their minds. That's what he's doing right here uh, with us. So he said, well, Moses did that. What can you do? <laughs> which reveals something else that remains today, which is so often people are more interested in the sign than they are in the substance. So many people are looking for a sign when they, ha they have an opportunity for the substance, right? Like a sign points to something. Jesus is saying, I'm the something. I'm what the sign is pointing to. You don't have to look any further. I am the destination. He lets them know, Moses didn't give you that bread. My father in heaven did. And today I am the bread that leads to everlasting life. They asked Jesus another question, which is where we'll end this. Uh, today. It's very um, critical. They says, well, Jesus, what do we have to do so that we can be doing the work of God? What do we have to do? Jesus' response to their question it might be the most illuminating and freeing thing in all of Scripture. This is the question that everybody wants to know. God, what is my job as your follower? What am I supposed to do? So many people attempt to answer this question. In the process, they unknowingly put weights and pressure on people unnecessarily. If you want to know the answer, if you want to know what you're supposed to do as a follower of Jesus, here it is right from Jesus' own mouth. He says, this is the work of God that you believe. Let me say it again. This is the work of God that you believe. Like, what? It got to be more than that. No, your job is to believe. You're doing the work of God when you believe. I always hear people say, you do your part and God will do his part. Makes me cringe a little bit. But no, if we put it in the right context, yeah, absolutely. Your part is to believe. His part is to deliver. Faith is your part. And really what faith is, faith is the channel to our relationship with God, our relationship with Jesus. Nothing more, nothing less. Don't miss the forest for the trees today. <clears throat> I heard a story about a missionary. This particular missionary served in a desert-like atmosphere. So what he would do is he would go get water. <clears throat> he would transport it and deliver it from village to village. One day as he, was, as he went out delivering water, going on his normal route, going on his normal journey, <clears throat> he never made it home. People, his family started to become alarmed. Eventually they found him. What happened is he had literally died from thirst, died from dehydration. The only thing was his wagon, his cart was full of water. He died within arm's reach of the very thing that he needed. Don't miss the forest for the trees today. Thanks again for tuning in. Hope that this word touched you. Hope that this word blessed you. If you haven't, go ahead and hit uh, the subscribe button. Share this message with a friend. See you next time.